Right, everyone. So we're going to be starting. And thank you very much for coming along this um, morning for on the short notice. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this event. And I think most of you would know me. I'm Fossi Alone, an associate professor and the um, associate director for the CPLR, which is the Public Law and Human Rights Forum here at City University. And it's a great pleasure that I have to um, do moderate and be a discussant on this um, event. And I would, uh, I'm very excited about this event. And uh, we have today a very amazing speaker, uh, uh, Captain Andy Xi Chen Tian, um, uh, who is a founder and president of Global Governance Institution and director of Center for International Law of Military Operations with us. And we also have Ms. Cho as well. Uh, she is a deputy director for Center for uh, Southeast Asia Studies Global Governance Institution, and she will participate in the discussion later on. And as a background to this event, I would want to give some information because I, I, I don't know many of you who attended the conferences before. And in 2021, the Center for Chinese and Comparative Law uh, and Public Law and Human Rights Forum, they organized two conferences on the Sino-Indian border disputes. And... Uh, uh, and in fact, these two conferences were based on my GRF grant uh, that was towards the peace, uh, peaceful uh, resolution of the signing the border dispute. It was a multidisciplinary study. And, um, uh, and uh, I was awarded this by RGC Hong Kong. So these conferences were trying to understand, uh, to promote uh, either the settlement or mitigation of the uh, SIBD while considering the um, uh, perspectives of inter international law and international relations, um, and considering the history, the uh, culture, the geography, that uh, that would help in resolving this dispute. So the goal was to explore to what extent the effective demarcation of territory calls for the inter interdisciplinary mm -hmm. approach. And um, and uh, Andy, uh, you know, Captain Tian was actually participated in both of those conferences. Uh, and um, the idea was that we would have these conferences and later on will provide some forward looking approach uh, to the outspread of the SIBD discussions beyond the conference. And this post uh, conference event that we have today, uh, which is titled as Pride and Prejudice in China India Relations is one such attempt. And I'm very uh, glad this morning that um, uh, Captain Tian uh, is participating in this discussion is uh, and um, and as we know that this is going to be before I start this is a hybrid uh, mode uh, uh, you know event and so the people who are uh, watching us from uh, from Zoom they, if they have any questions uh, please make sure that you write those questions in the chat box and later on uh, Captain Tian will provide the answers in the Q and A uh, section. And uh, so uh, we should now begin and let me, uh, 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 let's please uh, first welcome Captain Tian, who is uh, the founder and president of the Global Governance Institute and director of the Center of International Law of Military Operations. Currently, he's doing PhD in public international law at Wuhan University, and he has an LLM in public international law uh, from the University of Nottingham under the auspices of the UK FCO. Uh, Chivining Scholarship, as well as an LLM in the military law from the PLA uh, Xi'an uh, Academy of Politics. So his uh, academic interests focus on the areas of, um, of maritime security, uh, policy, international law of the sea, international humanitarian law, as well as international criminal law. And he has published extensively uh, in these uh, areas. And after retiring from the military, uh, Captain Tian used to work in the Grandview Institute as a VP for studies from 2019 to 2020, as well as worked in the ecological group of the Beijing Oriental Landscape and Environmental Corporation uh, Limited. And he was also the VP and CEO of the, uh, of the Business Development and Investment um, Department. So before he retired from the Chinese military Ministry of National Defense, Captain Tian headed the Department of uh, Crisis Management and Media Relations, uh, the Information Office and the MD, uh, MND. So he has served in various operational, legal and academic positions um, with PLA Army, Navy and the headquarters 
uh, of MND. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming Captain Thian to deliver his uh, uh, this speech. Um... Thank you. Thank you, Lom, uh, for having me here. And uh, thanks to all the audiences also uh, online. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here to, to have a talk on this uh, uh, China-India relations. In fact, as Long has introduced, uh, it would build upon the, the previous discussions we have, uh, we have done uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, your law faculty department is a, it's a great in that uh, you uh, not only study the articles and the text of law, but also um, try to apply the law to the international practice. So that is a great. So, you know, after our discussion and along the timeline, we, we saw the witnessed the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict and also their development in, 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 in the international uh, global order. So uh, this talk is built upon the previous discussion, but also I think amazed with some latest developments. Uh, so my discussion will yeah, we will be divided into three parts. And for the first two parts, it will give you a kind of background, a context, why uh, I want to talk about the issue of Sino-India border dispute. Uh, uh, background A is a lesson learned from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So we have a armed con like conflict, which have a huge consequences globally. I think we Asian Pacific countries should also learn something from this uh, this armed conflict because if this kind of armed conflict would happen in this region, it will have even uh, far uh, greater consequences. So that's uh, one of the background I would like to share with you, which is very important for us uh, in China when we think about the potential. Uh, tensions in the Sino-India border. So that's the first background. Secondly, uh, we also, um, within GGI, we are pushing an agenda on the initiative on inclusive coexistence of civilizations. That's another background. Uh, so this initiative is to the exact opposite of the clash of the civilizations uh, raised by a, an American scholar, uh, Samuel Huntington. I think uh, Long has just, uh, <laughs> is reading this book, <laughs> quite interesting. But so finally, as one of the pilot projects for our initiative, uh, we put forward this package deal uh, to try to solve the uh, Central India border dispute once and for all in a package bill. Uh, though it is a very big ambition, but I think uh, the GGF fellows, they are serious. They want to do difficult things because only difficult things values. So that's uh, a little bit um, on the top of the talk. So first, a few lessons uh, learned from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So this is the first one in my personal perspective. So the cause of the conflict is yet another example of how the pursuit of absolute security of individual country or bloc could bring severe consequences to the broader international security. So here I studied one poem from a poet in Song Dynasty. His name is uh, Su Dongpo a very popular, even in current days, a very popular, uh, not only poet, he also writes many essays, uh, a great, uh, and also his, uh, his, his, his writing is also very famous. So the poem goes like this. Um, in Chinese, to the reason that one cannot recognize the true face and the full picture of Lu Mountain, lies in that one has gone deep into the inside of Blue Mountain. So this is also the situation of Russia-Ukraine conflict. So if you are a Ukrainian 
or you are a Russian, or you are an individual uh, from EU countries. So you have different perspectives because either one of them, I think they are inside the mountains. So we now have different narratives. I think first we have narrative, it's a sovereignty versus aggression. So you see the media reports that uh, Russia is in, uh, in, uh, invaded uh, uh, Ukraine. So if you are Ukrainian, you think that you are defending your motherland, you are defending sovereignty. It's kind of a very uh, patriotic behavior. And it's perfect in a bilateral context. If you are, uh, if you are a citizen from EU countries or other US allies like Japan and South Korea, you would say that this is a, a kind of a, a war. We, we must side with the Ukraine because it's defending democracy uh, against the autocracy. And also, if we read the statements of the uh, president of uh, American Society of International Law and that of the European Journal of Inter International Law, uh, and also, you, you, if you, you look at the progress made by the International Criminal Court, so a lot of things is being done uh, to bring into justice the war criminals in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So again, you, you see a picture of, of, of a kind of a defending rule of law against war crime. So that is a kind of a picture you would see, I mean, when you are in one part of the country. So that's what we see, the media coverage. So it's a narrative of sovereignty versus uh, aggression, uh, patriotism versus invasion, and uh, democracy versus autocracy, and uh, rule of law versus war crime. So it's perfect in bilateral context. But then the question arises, so why the Asian, many Asian countries, Latin American countries and African countries, why they remain neutral in this armed conflict? So this is something that we, we, we need to take into consideration. So I, I, I studied the text of the statement released by the, by the president of the, those two international law associations. The, the point is, if you see this statement, they said that this, this is the first war since the Second World War, the first aggression in the EU, EU land, a war of aggression since the Second World War. So that's the description of the nature of this armed conflict. Then my background is legal. I think if I change the word Russia, into US. I didn't think I didn't think that it doesn't fit. So that's my impression. So let me say that in this regard, there is the question of moral integrity. I think the moral integrity, the, the minimum requirements of moral integrity is to apply the law to others the same as to yourself. So I think this is a kind of world. One reason why those countries and people remain neutral about it, because I think, I think it's not that they, they think that there is no war crimes, there's no war, uh, aggression. It's just because this kind of atrocities, the war crime, aggression, they, has, they, has, they have been committed by other countries in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya. So it has happened many times with no accountability. So that's raised the problem of moral integrity. And also, again, if you look at the progress, I should say great progress made by the uh, International Criminal Court, if you compare that with what they did with the, the situation in Afghanistan and, and, uh, and, and Iraq, it's quite different. So, on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, as, as it was said, 
by the chief prosecutor of ICC, came from UK, they sent the ever largest field, field investigator into the African conflict. So that's one point. Second, the United States set up one special organization under the leadership within the State Department. Its name is a Conflict Observatory to collect evidence in these armed conflicts. And also another point, it, 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 uh, you could see that EU sent lots of money to, to support the, the investigation. So that's the great progress made in the Russia-Ukraine conflict situation uh, by the ICC. But then if you look at the situation I just mentioned in, in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, I, I think you still remember that the, the, the previous uh, Secretary of the States uh, of US, uh, Pompeo, just sanctioned, sanctioned the ICC. So there's a sharp difference. So you would see that that is the kind of problem we call it moral integrity. So if this precedent, which has been made in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, in Kosovo, it, it, it is okay when the US is aggressor, but now for that kind of armed conflict, all the laws, all the international criminal laws, they are useless. They are not applying international criminal law to, to that part of the conflict. And now the international criminal law become important. The ICC become a very important organization. So that's, I think, is one of the reasons why the peoples in the countries from the Asian, African, and Latin American countries why they remain uh, uh, neutral on this point. Uh, also, again, there is the, the bilateral context versus global context. So when those things, which looks perfect in bilateral conflict, conflict, but if we look at it from the global governance perspective, we see that actually the nature of the armed conflict, we all know that, it's not only between Russia and Ukraine. It's, it's uh, I mean, one part, Ukraine is only, it's kind of a proxy war. It's, it's on the one part is the US led NATO because all the intelligence, ammunition, weapons are provided by, by the United States and NATO countries. And the other part is Russia. So that is the nature of the armed conflict. It's not purely a conflict, armed conflict between just uh, Russia and uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. So this is the, 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 from the uh, global context. So it's not purely a bilateral context. When it is a bilateral context, it, it's all those stories look very beautiful, perfect. But if you look at it from the global context, it's not that way. So then comes the causes of the armed conflict. So on the one part, on part of the uh, US-led NATO, they think that, so the NATO expansion is okay. It's not threatening Russia, but on part of the Russia, they think that the Russia-Ukraine conflict is a consequence of the NATO expansion. So that's the difference. I mean that I think I would, I would remind the audiences about the about the about the Cuba crisis. I think if you apply the same logic, so whether Russia feels threatened or not, I think it is up to Russia to make a decision, not by the U.S.-led NATO, because if this is the logic we can apply to the Cuban crisis, and then it, it should be also be be, at that time, it's the U.S. They feel the kind of being threatened, not the Russian side. So that is the bilateral contact versus the global contact. This is another element why uh, we remain neutral on these points. And finally, I think if you compare the Russia-Ukraine conflict to the armed conflict I mentioned in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, in Libya. So the difference is that in that categories of conflict, it is the United States who is aggressor, 
in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, conflict is the, it is the Russia that is the aggressor. So you see the picture that in the global context, I mean, when U.S. as one uh, South Korean professor uh, told me a few days ago when I had a seminar in, in, in Sri Lanka, when any country, when its GDP raised to a level of uh, some percentage of the United States, the United States would think it as a pacing challenge. So to remain at, at at, uh, to, to keep its uh, predominance and prominence and American first, so they have to do something. Uh, whether, whether in the economic field, uh, like the previous Japan, EU, or Germany, or in security area, like now uh, Russia, China, and even India, maybe uh, for China and Russia is on the table, India is, is under the table. So for this conflict, it is Russia who is the aggression. So you see a kind of overlapping of interests between the U.S. strategic aim of keeping its position as the first class section of Snowpiercer, a film, uh, Snowpiercer, and the, in, the its allies values and also values of international community in defending democracy and the rule of law. So it's that overlapped, which means that it created a kind of a very weird dilemma of choice. So for EU countries, for many, I mean, US allies, they have no choice but to be side with Ukraine because only take side with Ukraine, it fits with the values in defending democracy, in defending rule of law. So this interest is perfect fit with the US interests it's a strategic interest to keep its dominance. So that is the obvious overlapping of interest. It's only in this interest. So the US can man manipulate this kind of dilemma. So they, can, they have no choice but to side with the Ukraine. It's not the case in the previous armed conflict. So this is one point. I think also the reason why uh, uh, those countries and people remain neutral. So this is the lesson one, and I also would like to share with you lesson two. The seemingly endless conflict reminds us how easy it is to start a war and how difficult it is to end one. Whoever hung the bell on the tiger's neck must untie it. This is an old scene uh, from Chinese ancient culture. And another one is uh, we should resolve contradictions rather than deepen them so specifically. I think now we see, we could not see any obvious exit strategy in terms of, I mean, willingness and ability. I mean, to start a peace negotiation, to end the war, you either, you, you have to have willingness and ability. But I think, both political and militarily, for also for both parts, it's very difficult for them to, to, to back down. So let's uh, just take the US for example. I mean, not, not to see political, just to see military. So on the one hand, you see that uh, they are providing weapons and ammunitions. On the other hand, I, I think they are very cautious. These kind of weapons provided must must to keep them at a at a kind of a low level. It it must not be so advanced, because if it go too far, then they have a kind of worry of uh, the escalation of conflict. They have a worry that uh, maybe I mean under the pressure and the stress, and uh, when when being uh, when being threatened critically. And then the, the Russia, maybe they will result to the nuclear weapons. So that is something very embarrassed. On the one hand, they cannot back down. On the other hand, if they, if we, if they push too hard, there's also no way out. So that is the situation we see now. Uh, so for the current situation, what we 
could see that as long as far as the current situation uh, concerns, it will exist as it is, as it is now. So no one can see any way out. So that is the uh, one point, no visible exit strategy. And also, I think, as I mentioned about the overlapping interest, I think this is a kind of a one stone many birds. So if we look at the picture, if you jump out of the bilateral conflict, you can imagine or you can analyze who suffers most, who is victims. I mean, first, we see the weakening of Russia and the destroying of Ukraine. So I think now we see Zelensky is a hero of their country, but we could also imagine how many years it will take for the, for the Ukraine people to recover and how many years it will take to kill the psychological entanglement between Russian people and the Ukraine people, just like this kind of entanglement I will mention later, between Russia, between Chinese and Japanese, between India and China. So this kind of psychological entanglement will be there for many years to overcome. Then if we look back, is there any possible ways that we can prevent this kind of armed conflict to happen? That is also one of the reasons why we look at the Sino-India uh, uh, Sino border dispute. Uh, so, and also you could see weakening of EU in relying more on US with less strategic autonomy. I will not expand on that. And also I think uh, under the context of, context of uh, China and US competition, it also provided new logic, uh, new tools for, uh, for US to contain China. And uh, simultaneously, it relieved the United States from Afghanistan evacuation. I think if there is no Russia-Ukraine conflict, still the Afghanistan situation will be there for international community to deal with. Now, no one care about that. I will also come back later to, to this point. And also, it has unintended consequences for small and medium countries. Uh, I was ju just back from a conference in uh, Sri Lanka. We know that Sri Lanka has a bankruptcy problem. In fact, Sri Lanka is not one country that is targeted by sanctions, but with the rise of the prices and the inflation, so no one can escape from the negative consequences uh, produced by this armed conflict. So I think, finally, I think I think the ball is the head as as the hand of the United States, uh, because as I said, uh, he yeah this old uh, scene says, uh, whoever hung the bill on the tiger's neck must untie it. Uh, also, I mean, just imagine, I mean, I mean, the, the un unconceivable um, potential, if, I mean, if the situation developed deteriorate, then we could, it, it will be disastrous. I mean, if the nuclear point element uh, comes in, and also if the same kind of North Stream 2 situation also happens, uh, we cannot imagine what will happen in that situation. Uh, for the Nord Stream 2, there is a very interesting situation. So when I was in Beijing, many defense attaches come to visit our think tank. And there was uh, one time when, when four defense attaches uh, come to me to dis discuss this point, uh, only, one, only one defense attache, I will not name them, only one defense attache says clearly that uh, because this is something that could not be done by terrorists. So it's so certificated. It, it could only be done be by the United States. That's the only defense attaché. But for the other three defense attaché, uh, either they are partners or allied with the United States, they just kept silent. Whatever we talk, they just keep silent. So this is the second lesson. And the third lesson, I think in today's world, 
bilateral conflicts between key countries could have far-reaching impact on international order and global security. Every country should make a fair balance between development and security. So here again, I cited a few sentences from from a uh, from a military work. Uh, create also, I think all you all of you are familiar with the the art of war by Sun Tzu. So, but actually, we have many other uh, similar uh, those uh, military strategy work like the Sima Fa. So it reads that even for a powerful country, um, bellicosity will ruin itself. Though the world peaceful and prepared for war, puts the country in danger. So that is something we call a balance uh, between development uh, and security. And also it, uh, uh, it also relates to, um, to uh, GDI and GSI. So um, China put forward a global security initiative and a global development initiative. So some academics in China, uh, they will follow those two initiatives uh, to, to focus separately on either GDI or GSI. In our perspective, I think uh, the GDI and the GSI, they are closely related to with each other. Uh, it's just an international version of one of the domestic governing principle of, of how to balance uh, development and security. Uh, in my opinion, it's kind of philosophy. It can apply to any areas. Uh, to any bilateral or regional relations, uh, to any areas of governance, either maritime governance, either domestic governance in environment, in pandemic. Uh, let's take the pandemic, for example. At the very beginning, when the pandemic is very severe, it's, uh, it's taking uh, lives, then the focus, the priority should be given to security in the sacrifice of development. Then when the situation developed, uh, when 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 situation has changed better, when it is not so threatening, in particular for for uh, for life threatening, then we should relieve those restrictions. But how a country can balance uh, between the development and security, it is an art. Uh, so specifically, I had a, also a few um, points. I think first I would like to share is that. The stolen priority of a global agenda setting as a result of security trap set by the United States. What I see security trap is that, so under the U.S.-China competition, uh, when U.S. Um, pushed the uh, China-U.S. competition through all of the government approach, then we can see that every normal relations, even economic, scientific, or cultural exchanges they are being related to national security concerns. Uh, this is the one phenomenon. And uh, we could see the, the overstretching of national security concerns in every area. So we see in this Asia uh, Pacific region, because we have, we have uh, tensions with India in, 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 in the land borders and in the, as for the sea border, ocean borders, uh, South China Sea, and also uh, uh, East China Sea with Japan in Diaoyu Island. So those are some of the tensions which have been there long, long term dispute. They have been there for, for quite a long time. But now they are being described in the media as kind of new flashpoints. So China is being described as assertive, aggressive. So this is the situation. So to respond to the to the tension, to the hypothetic, aggressive, and uh, and uh, and assertive uh, uh, China, so some countries are pouring resources to the security. So the armed risk, the arsenal, they're also a a trend that uh, many countries are buying weapons to to fill their arsenals. But those kind of threats. Created, uh, created that imagine that China is a threat to respond to China's threat. 
it's a kind of a hypothetical scenario, but it's it has stolen the priority of the agenda setting of not only each country, but also, also the whole global world. I mean, just imagine, just imagine that how many resources are, are devoted to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, conflict. Just imagine, you know, with the armed conflict, there is a rise of energy prices. So many EU countries, in particular Germany and France, they are giving allowance, energy allowance to enterprises. So if a tiny part of those allowance is taken away to try to use it to solve a South, South China problem, it, it will settle a huge problems. So those resources, which could and should have been used to solve Afghanistan uh, humanitarian disaster, to solve uh, Somali famine, to solve uh, Pakistan flood, to solve uh, Turkish earthquake, to solve even the California, the, the hot waves, has been stolen to devote to be devoted to the security area. So this is why I see that this kind of uh, overstretching national concerns is kind of a security trap. It has stolen the priority uh, of the global agenda setting. So, I mean, every country, they need to take a balance between development and security. And this is, this is an, I think on the day we are discussing in Sri Lanka, also that day, uh, at that day we are discussing the situation and the, the lessons, also the lessons learned from Russia-Ukraine conflict. It happened that on that exact day, the BBT covered a story that story is about uh, UN Secretary General uh, Guterres is holding a conference, Doha conference, uh, uh, focusing on the Afghanistan situation. In addition to the policy part of that coverage, the, the BBC coverage that day also recorded an episode of, of situation, of humanitarian situation in, in Afghanistan. They recorded the exact sound of a boy, his voices, I mean, his exhale, inhale and exhales. So gradually, the, the, the sound of the exhales and inhales gradually weakened, and then the boy died. I mean, on that exact morning, it took me many minutes, 20 or half minutes, to, to try to recover from the, the dark mood. So the figures given by BBC is that at least 167 children is dying in Afghanistan. As released by the figures of the figures by the UN that conference, about 90%, above 90% of the Afghanistan people, they are lived in, they lived in poverty. But only 6% of the of the fund which needs to solve the problem is coming. So there is a huge gap for international funding. So if there, I mean, foreign reserves could be relieved by the United States, that could solve a great problem. But now because of situation in Ukraine, uh, in, in Russia-Ukraine conflict, no one take care about the Afghanistan situation. No one think about why the Af Afghanistan now is in such a situation. Why each day 167 babies are dying. I'm a father. So when I listen to that episode, it, it really hurts conscience. It really hurts her conscience. But those kind of things has taken, has taken priority of the global agenda setting on secured, uh, on development. By, uh, by overstretching national concerns. So finally, I think as uh, we people from the Asia Pacific countries, we should uh, try to think what are our common identities, uh, common shared concerns. I, I frequently use this word identity. I think, you know, for, for every person, I think during life, you will, you will face two questions. One is who I am. 
who I am. The other is what do you want. For the question of what do you want, it is always easy to 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 bargain it out. So let let's say I'm selling the mineral waters. Long want to buy it, buy it. Uh, he want to buy it uh, with uh, ten dollars. I want to sell at uh, twenty dollars. But finally, through bargaining, we can reach agreement. It's difficult to reach agreement with the identity issues. Who I am, uh, like the uh, if you are a uh, uh, Christian and entity, and then he's a uh, Islamic. It's difficult to reach a deal. So that's only only one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, we find it that any cooperation between countries, between organizations, and even people-to-people -people cooperation is just to find a common identity. And let me speak this way. I mean, even Russia and Ukraine, uh, Russia and Ukraine, they are now fighting with each other. It depends on where they stand. Still, they have many common identities. I mean, in our annual reports last year, I read a sentence, I read a passage in, in, the, in the opening statement of our annual report last year. I said that we used to look at the world. We start from ourselves, and then look at our family, society, a country, the globe, and then the universe. But if we look from the opposite side, if we stand in the galaxy, if we look from the universe to the globe, from the whole global to your country, from your country to the society, to the family, it's totally different. Then we would find climate change is a shared identity. So this kind of shared identity, everybody can find, even to animate, they can find identities, neighbors' identities, alumni identity. Even we like a, a same film, it's kind of identity. So any cooperation, to, to symbolize it, it's, it's just to find an identity. So what we can find in Asia Pacific, so I listed here a few points. First, maintaining peace and pursue prosperity. This is our, our common identity. That is also why I see that, uh, you know, as, as for the uh, Taiwan Street and the cross street relations, we all know that it is a, it is the, a, I mean, in China's perspective, it's that with domestic affairs, we do not want to be interfered by, by, by others, but it do has international concerns because if armed conflict arises, then it will be concerns for countries in all, all countries in this region, because just imagine a kind of armed conflict like the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Every country in this region cannot escape uh, from the consequences of such a big conflict, just imagine the the involvement of the, the of the military invention of the United States. So that's I mean to to maintaining peace and the prosperity. This is the common interest. This this is the common identity shared by all countries. That's that is also why we we try to to give a package deal to to China India uh, border dispute because a common peace and the prosperity is our common identity. And also to avoid a Russia-Ukraine scenario in the yeah. South China Sea, not only in South China Sea, uh, in South China Sea, uh, China-India scenario and China-Japan scenario. So this is uh, another point, it's our shared identity. I mean, not only those countries directly involved in these situations, it's not only, uh, only between uh, between uh, between China and India, between China and Japan, it is the common identity shared by all the countries in this region. We have to solve it, and also to embrace strategic autonomy for this region. So we have to have our own mind, make our own decisions how to balance between development and security. I mean, you know, as for the South China Sea dispute, you know. There are many claimants. So let's take China Malaysia relations, for example. So it is an issue between uh, of the uh, Sino Malaysia relations. But how are you going to deal with? Is this that 
because we have a conflict, then first we settle the conflict, we fight a war to settle it once and for all, then we develop our relations. All that we know that this dispute, only one part of, a tiny part of the sino malaysia relations. And then we keep it, we negotiate, try to find a peaceful approach. But at the same time, the existence of a dispute between our countries does not prevent us from developing economic relations. So that is also another application of the philosophy of balance, uh, of balance between development and security. And finally, I think also achieving reconciliation and not letting history to repeat itself. And all those regions we have witnessed many wars which have far, um, far severe consequences. You know, the United States have come to this region with the uh, Korean War. Still, the negative legacy, the ne negative legacy is still there. The tension is still over there in the Korea Peninsula. Uh, they are here also the 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 Vietnam War, Afghanistan War. So we cannot like also not to see the Second World War. We cannot let the history repeat itself. I mean, either between China and India or between China and Japan, we Asian people must achieve reconciliation. So. These are a few lessons we learned from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which tell us how important to keep peace, how important we try to solve those kind of problems, either territorial problem or other, uh, or other small, tiny problem through peaceful ways, instead of resulting to use of force. And also, as a second background, I will cover it very briefly. So we are pushing the initiative on inclusive coexistence of civilizations, I call it ICEC. So it is a kind of um, a theory to the exact opposite of Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. So according to Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, there will be clashes between Christianity and Islam, uh, between Christianity and the Confucianism, or the combined, there will definitely be clashes. And many Western scholars buy it, but from a perspective of a Chinese scholar, I think if we look at international practice, if we look at the historical experience, we, we could see that the, the inclusive coexistence of civilizations did exist and have guided many good international practices. So even within one country, I think China has, 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 a, has a history of, of inclusive coexistence of civilizations. If, if you know Chinese history, you know we have a, a philosopher uh, who is, um, although not as famous as a Confucius, uh, still the current uh, Chinese scholar still follow him. His name is uh, uh, Wang Yangming. So his philosophy is just a mix of uh, Buddhism with Taoism with Confucianism. So that's a kind of coexistence of civilizations. And also, if if we apply this theory to the maritime context, the seven expenditures made by Chen He in Ming Dynasty is another example of inclusive coexistence of civilization. So Zheng He made visits to many countries, to many areas, even far to the Africa countries, uh, not to say in the Southeast Asia, the South Asia countries. So it's change of cultures. There's no colony, I mean, any, no colony being left by his journeys. And also if you look at the the buildings in one of the cities, which is a starting port city of the of the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, the city's name is Zhangzhou. There are many buildings in Zhangzhou. They are kind of a mix of civilizations. So you could see the, the, the character of those buildings. They, 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 looks, they have elements from Roman Catholic. They have elements from ancient Chinese. They also have elements from the Buddhism. 
it's another example of the bilateral coexistence of, of uh, uh, civilizations. So even we can see that, let, let's say the Chinese people, when they move to another country, I mean, they become Chinese Americans, they become Chinese UK, they become Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese uh, Malaysians. Still, I think they go along very well with, with other ethnic groups. It is also even the independence as a country of Singapore, 70% of them are not Chinese. That also reflects the philosophy of inclusive coexistence of civilizations. So that's the reason why we, we try to develop this theory to the exact opposite of semi hinting to the clash of civilizations. We want to build this theory to guide international practice. So what we are going to do is to, it's a kind of a, a three-stage ambition. At the first stage, we study the historical and the practical experiences. I mean, even for the current international practice, I think uh, the deal rate between Saudi Arabia and Iran is also another example reflecting the bilateral, the, the, in, the inclusive coexistence of civilizations. So I think we can use this theory to solve all kinds of uh, domestic governance and international governance. That is the first stage we would take uh, two or three or four years to study all those kind of uh, cases, experience. And then for the second stage, we are going to hold international ICEC summit. Finally, at the end of the day, we are going to develop, set up an international NGO. It's called International Fund for ICEC. So that's our ambition. So the Sino-India border conflict is a pilot project under this initiative. So we want to use this initiative to try to solve the practical problems between China and India. I, 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 when I was in Sri Lanka, I also discussed this problem with one uh, Indian major general. He also recommended me that uh, there is one Indian scholar who, who, who wrote a very beautiful good book. It's also a coexistence of Buddhism and Confucianism. So, again, finally, to our focus, the case study of, of Sino India border disputes. Actually, since I have given you a long story about the background, it will be easy for me to explain to you what is our package deal for the Sino India border dispute. So, here I have uh, three questions. By answering these questions, uh, you will have a clear idea of what. Uh, we have designed uh, to solve this problem. First, why it is difficult to settle Sino-India boundary dispute compared with other 12 of the 14 land borders between China and its neighbors? So, as I said in the Western media, China is, is always being described as uh, aggressive, as assertive because of those maritime disputes. But actually, and also they had a kind of uh, logic uh, describing China as kind of a, a strong country, bullying small countries, uh, uh, the, the, the big has to say, this is also another logic. Uh, so this is a kind of a succeeded trap. One country becomes stronger and bigger, then it will expand. That's the logic. But in a very sharp difference, actually, if you look, look at the strength of China, we are quite a strong I mean, military at army. You all know that the Chinese military, they are quite strong at fighting land wars, not to say the, the, the historical uh, legacies from Sun's art of war, but also through those years of uh, development, you know, we fought, I mean, when the, the, even before the founding of the People's Liberation Army, we fought with the Kuomintang, uh, we, we, uh, we did what we did in the anti-Japanese uh, war and also what we did in the in, in the Korea War, it shows that we are quite strong with this army. If we use this kind of logic of the Western logic that uh, since China is strong and army, they should expand the military in the land border, in the land area. But in fact, among the 14 land borders of China, we settled 12 of those land borders through peaceful negotiations. But all the Western scholars just turned a blind eye to it 
but actually we are we are we are weak at navy. Now we have a strong navy, but these are only only developments of those maybe parts of ten or twenty years. But actually, we have a strong uh, heritage of fighting a land war. So that's the first question. The second question: is Why China and India must settle their uh, land border dispute peacefully and once and for all? Or I can put the question another way. All the Western scholars just turn a blind eye to it. But actually, we are, we, are, we are weak at Navy. Now we have a strong Navy. But these are only, only developments of those maybe parts of 10 or 20 years. But actually, we have a strong uh, heritage of fighting a land war. So that's the first question. The second question is, why China and India must settle their uh, land border dispute peacefully and once and for all? Or I can put the question another way. What are the major benefits for the two countries to settle their border dispute peacefully? This is the second question. The third one is how to solve Central India border dispute peacefully and as well once and for all. So I will, one by one, question one. So for the first question, I, I identified four challenges why it is difficult to settle this problem. And the first challenge is the nature and the sensitivity of territorial sovereignty. So because it is territorial sovereignty issue, so for either part, for either country, it's very difficult for them to back up. So no country would like to give promise, give, give, uh, to, 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 to have compromise. Uh, that is the first challenge, the primary challenge. The second one, oriental cultural similarity and the differences. So first one is national pride. I mean, this is a, this is a kind of particular oriental culture, national pride, and the face-saving tendency, and denial of judicial processes. So those are both shared uh, common, not only in India, but also in, in China, uh, cultural similarities. So let's say national pride in those areas which have tensions in 2020 and uh, afterwards, those areas, those sections of, uh, of, of borders they can only be accessed in summer times by both sides. And even in terms of the resources, <coughs> excuse me, even in terms of uh, natural resources, there's no great values. It's more of a national pride why they fight each other. And also, no one wants to lose face. So it's, it's the Oriental culture. It's just over there. They are fighting for national pride, not because uh, this section border is uh, very important in terms of natural resources or even military advantages. Actually, if you look at the borders between China and India on the high mountains, it's not a perfect battlefield. It's very difficult to fight a war. But still, the two big countries are fighting each, up, each other over the borders. It's to a very large extent, it's because of national pride. So also, uh, I also listed here the psychology of 1960 war. But this kind of psychology, I understand it. It does not exist only in India. It also exists in China. I mean, between China and Japan. For many average Chinese people still, you, you could see many dramas in, in TV dramas in in, in mainland China, it's very popular, but I don't see it as a, a, a good phenomenon. You know, as China becomes stronger and bigger, I think we need a kind of mature national psychology. But now we are also having problems, this kind of problem with national, the building of some a good national psychology. I mean, they are two extreme, extreme points. On the one hand, we can have kind of a victim psychology. I mean, it is rooted in the in the even in the Qing Dynasty uh, when Western country invaded China. Also, it it it, it take it, took its root in the anti-Japanese war. So those are the kind of the sources of the victim psychology. I mean, I think the bad thing, the negative consequence for the victim psychology is that 
it naturally produces this kind of psychology of taking revenge. That is something we cannot allow it to happen. So that is, the, I mean, if there is a wide range, that is the one, one extreme point. On the other point, you know, as China develops, you know, people have money. So some people also, I call it in Chinese words, 爆发户心态, which means that we, when they get richer, they look down upon some people. They begin to, to have, it's not a, a good pride. Uh, they, 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 I, 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 actually, I, I couldn't describe it in English. It's kind of a, uh, another bad sexuality. So those kind of things we must overcome. I often listed examples. And, uh, you know, as China and India and Japan, and China, we must achieve peace. I mean, these this countries in this must re- achieve final reconciliations. Only then we can achieve development. Just like, you know, um, UK and France, they fight 100 years. German and France, they also have long years work. But, but finally, they achieved reconciliation. And finally, when the peace achieved in EU land, then they achieved development. It is a situation, same situation in Asia Pacific. We must try to achieve uh, this kind of uh, reconciliation. So second one, a third one, very important, negative influence of nationalism, populism, and social media combined with social media. So this is something that, that is uh, getting out of control for each country, not only, I mean, led by Trump, not only in the United States, led by Trump, in many countries, populism is a kind of something which is getting out of control. But those voices are larger than the, major- than the silent majority. That's the problem. So when a country, they want to reach a, a peace deal at a policy level, then there will be always somebody in the social media, they have great pressure on the government. So that's the third challenge. And finally, uh, China-U.S. strategic rivalry imposed, uh, imposed upon China and pushed by the United States in all respect of international relations. So I know that some Western countries, they will not buy this point, but it's our perspective. I just want to share with you. I mean, in our opinion, the United States is trying to, 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 to leverage every aspect to push for China-U.S. strategic level. Uh, US, uh, uh, strategic competition. So obviously, for the China-India border dispute, if, if there is armed conflict arises, it will again be the one stone killing many birds. Not only it killed China as uh, uh, as a as a as a competitor uh, on the table, but also India under the table. So. This is a question one. And the question two, exactly why China and India must settle their problem. So I also listed a few points. First is to turn the strategic liability to strategic assets. So this border dispute, it prevented the development of sound economic relations between China and India. So not only, you know, we have just recovered from the 1962 war. So China and, and, and India have developed a very good relationship. I mean, the economic, there are lots of investment from Chinese company to India. But from the, uh, the previous incident, I'm the 2020, uh, 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 Galavan, uh, 2020 Galavan incident, again, you know, it's very difficult for, uh, for, for you to, to, to uh, to kill from the hurt, but it's very easy for you to widen the hurt. Again, I think the consequences of that incident it had on the India people is far greater than the average Chinese people would think of it. That's an impression when I dis- discuss with the Indian colleagues. But that happened. We have to look forward. So, second point to benefit the civilian people and the military on both sides in terms of permanent peace and prosperity. I will not expect, uh, expand on that. You, you, you could see from the word. And third, to promote world peace and stability by 
consolidating a multilateral, a multipolar world order. That's something that I always emphasize when I speak with the Indian colleague. Actually, we want to see a we want to see a stronger India. We want to see a prosperous India, because that will contribute to a balanced multilateral world order. And uh, it's also linked with the with, with uh, another point. Uh, uh, yeah, the final one to enjoy land power. Notwithstanding the sea power, you know when the American captain raised the concept of the sea power, you know all countries are pursuing a kind of uh, to a very large extent the sea power. They want to expand their military uh, strength to have sea control. Uh, that's the sea power. But what we can see at the, in recent year, they are is kind of a, a, a rise of land power. So. There is kind of balance, check and balance between land power and the sea power. What I mean by land power, I mean the elements of land power in recent years is, is increasing greatly. So what are those elements? I mean, the pipelines, the highways, the energies, those are elements of land power. So if China and India join together, so I think they can they can list the potential of the land power when they draw together, not only the sea power, because the land power, they, I mean, when they settle the dispute, then the two lands join together. So there is a great potential uh, for, the, for, the, for the exploitation of land power. And the first one, I see that it deny the chance for third parties to make profits. What I mean, you, you see that it's a, uh, uh, it, it should not be monopolized by the U.S.-China competition. So finally, come to my conclusion. So how to solve China india dispute peacefully and once for all? So first, I borrowed some good experience practice from American context to divide the whole sino india border into various sections depending on their natural conditions. So that's the first point, what, what I'm going to do. So in the maritime context, some maritime neighbors, they do not develop the, uh, divide their boundary lines by an exact actual line. Instead, they set up a kind of a joint development zones. There's no actual boundary, but there is a kind of a zone, a GDZ, GDZ. This zone I mean, in this zone, they have uh, different allocations of resources and incomes. They have joint uh, jurisdiction. They have joint controls. So this context is a kind of a good practice in maritime context. So I borrow this element, the element of maritime good practice to the land context. So depending on their natural conditions, I mean, in those regions, which is very difficult to access and only in the summertime we can access it. We can set up non-military zones. We can set up digital boundaries. So for other section of borders, if there are many cultural exchanges, we can, I mean, also uh, there is a corridor for the, for the believers, believers of Buddhism uh, to worship. We can set up a cultural zone and a religious zone. And for some environment fragile sections, we can set up environment protection zone, just like in the in, in the maritime context, and uh, also for some areas that we, if we can develop a tour, tourism industry, we can set up a joint tourism zone, and also for for border trade, also we can set up a free trade zones. So that's the that is what I'm going to do with uh, those sections. But what what I'm going to deal with the most challenging point, the sovereignty, is that, I mean, either Chinese government or India government, they can still keep their position with, uh, in terms of sovereignty. They can still say to their own people that we have no changes in terms of territory. So no one will back up in terms of territory, sovereignty. But for those different sections of zones, we have joint jurisdiction. We have we, we have we we jointly de develop those zones. So, this is the main idea. 
of this pact deal. And then first, I think non-disputed area could be first be identified as a kind of early gains. So for the disputed area, the two sides could retreat to a line which is not disputed by the other sides. And finally, I mean, to form a, to form a final proposal, I think we can set up a joint task force of international experts, not only China and India, including not only scholars, the retired you know, uh, diplomats uh, from both sides, but also from the third parties, which has good uh, experience in mediating uh, international dispute. So this is the idea uh, I had as a pilot project of our inclusive uh, coexistence of uh, civilizations. And now we are also expanding our international net networks. So we welcome all the partners, uh, scholars, organizations to join, join us, to join us, to develop this uh, coexistence, bilateral co uh, inclusive coexistence of civilizations to, do, to, build, to build a better world, to build a peaceful world for our generation and our generation's generation. Thank you.